as always happens in any research area, you solve one set of questions to be raised in the question. So I'd like to, in the second part of the talk, really uh, share some new data, some cutting edge results that haven't even been published yet, which I think are um, helping us to formulate some new questions. And as we'll see as we go, about the value as a theoretical concept or construct uh, in terms of its ability to explain behavior. We're going to talk about how organisms' behavior reveals how they value, what, what value um, they might place upon an outcome. Um, and so the status of value as an explanatory construct, we'll see that it's very useful, but we'll be asking the question eventually, is value in fact valid? So, okay, I'll start with a brief history, a very brief history of matching research that was conducted after Einstein's original paper. And uh, because the results were so striking, researchers, primarily at Harvard, but also other places, began looking at other species and looking at other uh, reinforcement variables. And I'm just, I just have a few papers here. Uh, Charlie Catania, 1963, found that approximate matching relative reinforcer of magnitude, that is the where magnitude is measured as the duration of access to food, relative immediacy of reinforcement, China and Kernstein uh, delayed the reinforcers in a concurrent schedule and found that relatively less delayed or more immediate reinforcers uh, were associated with a greater uh, degree of uh, preference. Um, and also Bronson Klisikoff used a response independent reinforcement and found a match when they used time allocation relative time uh, spent on each alternative as their event. So all of these results were really tied up quite nicely by Bowen and Rackman and another classic paper, 1969. Um, and their paper was really the first to extend the notion of matching to a relative value. If on the left-hand side of the equation, we've got the ratio of responses to the left and right keys, uh, we can understand that matching uh, occurs to relative value, that is, the response allocation equals the value ratio, but value is determined as the product of the ratios of different reinforcer variables. So here we've got the ratio of reinforcer rates, the ratio of reinforcer magnitudes, and the ratio of reinforcer immediacies. So the idea is that value is determined by a combination of different reinforcer variables. And not long after this, there were some important conceptual papers noting that matching now, when we talk about matching to relative value, matching has essentially attained the status of an accident. Howie Rackman was the first to point this out. Matching law is a tautology. Since no constraints except the enforcement value are assumed to be affecting choice, the choice is assumed to be a direct measure of reinforcement value. And the argument was refined a year later by Peter Killeen, who noted that research on choice should attempt to identify the transformations necessary to yield matching, uh, which in turn, what, what, once we knew the functional relations, once we knew the mathematical transformations that would produce matching, that would tell us how reinforcement value was determined by the parameters of reinforcement. So matching had become an assumption. And so we call this, we'll call this the theoretical matching law. Colleen referred to this as such, the so-called theoretical matching law. Now, a couple of years later, um, Billy Baum proposed a generalized matching law. It started by noting that there were some empirical deviations from matching which had been recorded in the literature, which could be uh, accommodated by a generalized, more general version of the basic matching equation. And there were two types of uh, deviations from matching that he observed. What's known as bias, where there's a constant preference for one alternative or another that's independent of the relative rate of enforcement. And also something called undermatching, where response allocation was less extreme. Maybe you have a reinforcer ratio of 2 to 1, but the response allocation maybe is in a 3 to 2 ratio. So the ratio, so the response ratio is less extreme than the reinforcer ratio. This is known as undermatching. 
And it turns out that both those types of deviations can be accommodated by a power function generalization of the original matching equation. This is probably familiar to most of you, where B, a multiplicative constant, is biased, and an exponent, A, is sensitivity of response allocation to reinforcer allocation. And the generalized matching law is perhaps more readily understood if you take logarithms of both sides, which yields a linear equation in which A is the slope of the line and log B is the intercept. And so typically what's done is you get a match the equation from New Hampshire, responding in concurrent schedules and plot of the log response ratio against the log reinforcer ratio, we conduct a linear regression. Uh, and the slope of the regression, which here is 0.8, is sensitivity to reinforcement, and the intercept is bias 0.04. Uh, the dashed line would be perfect matching. This bird is showing a slight degree of undermatching, which is quite typical. So the main take-home message, really, about the generalized matching law is that response allocation is a linear function of reinforcement allocation. And generalized matching law was subsequently in the 1970s extended as a descriptive model of choice in concurrent schedules. Um, Bauer and later article analyzed 100 data sets and found that they accounted for 90% of the variance in log response ratios. And the Bauer and Rathen uh, concatenated matching law can be generalized by, oops, can be generalized by basically taking ratios of reinforcer rates, magnitudes, and indices, each with their own sensitivity parameters. So this so-called concatenated generalized matching law is a candidate for a, a version of matching that can account for uh, behavior in the current schedules. So some of the major themes of subsequent research, that is research that, that was carried out after the generalized matching law search, Accepted quantitative description of choice it includes research that was testing basically is, is the generalized matching law adequate as a model for choice? Uh, what causes matching? And we've got this robust empirical phenomenon. Can we understand matching in terms of more fundamental processes? Uh, a lot of research on matching versus maximizing, but I'm not really going to spend much time on this was a major theme. Do is the matching law uh, basically the really important relationship we're having? Organisms learn to maximize the overall weight of return on concurrent schedules. And many studies on that question. And also a lot of studies developing quantitative models for choice and related phenomena. Some of these based on the generalized matching law and some coming from other principles, but signal detection and condition of enforcement. Now, this, so this is a very large area. We're not even going to have time to cover all of this. We're going to give you a sense of what some of the other major themes were. And I'd like to focus a little bit on the problems with generalized matching that were uncovered by the researchers. And there's a common thread that runs through these studies. Basically, response allocation turned out to be affected by the overall reinforcer variables, not just the relative reinforcer variables. So for instance, all South and all South and South at the University of Auckland uh, showed that overall reinforcer rate in concurrent schedules, when you increase the overall reinforcer rate, the sensitivity parameter actually increased a little bit. It's a small effect, but it's reliable. Logan Shabaro, 1987, showed overall reinforcer magnitude affected sensitivity to reinforcer magnitude. Davison, Michael Davison, also at the University of Auckland, 1988, uh, showed that there was an interaction between relative magnitude and overall reinforcement rate. So these are just a few of the studies, there are others, but there were empirical difficulties that the generalized matching law encountered as a description of choice. Now I'd like to turn to the other question, or one of the other major questions that was explored, that is what causes matching? What, like what's, what's going on? This is such an important empirical result. Certainly, we have an understanding of why an organism matches. And in fact, you might even say that this is like the holy grail of research on choice behavior. But 
necessarily this procedure may not be able to provide a clear and definite answer to this question. You might say, why? Well, let's consider one of the more recent studies that's, that's looked at concurrent schedules. Uh, Davis and Bound 2000 exposed pigeons to seven different concurrent schedule pairs in each session. So they gave pigeons exposure to a wide range of reinforcer ratios in each session. And the pigeons were given extensive training over 65 sessions, I think, per condition in this experiment. And these are the results uh, for one of, or for two of the conditions in their experiment. They were looking at possible, at all possible sequences of reinforcers. Essentially, when the when the key lights were turned on in the Davis and Mouse procedure, the pigeons didn't know which alternative was going to provide a higher rate of reinforcement, so they had to learn. And Davis and Mouse showed that indeed they did learn that each reinforcer had an effect on behavior. Uh, and the conclusion was, and this is in the title of the paper, every reinforcer counts. Every reinforcer had an impact on choice behavior. But if you sit back a minute and think, well, if every reinforcer counts, that is, if each reinforcer has an impact, perhaps an equivalent impact on choice, then wouldn't matching just be the expected outcome? In fact, wouldn't it be a trivial outcome if each reinforcer has the same impact on choice? Okay. But if it's that simple, why are there so many theories that have been advanced to explain matching? And this slide just has a partial list uh, perhaps it's because we have so many good researchers in our field that we have so many theories. Uh, but many of these theories uh, are very quantitative and very so sophisticated theories. Uh, and I'm not going to really talk about any of them. I'm going to suggest instead that the problem of concurrent schedules as a procedure uh, that sort of created this, this, this difficulty that we have in terms of having many theories and having it be very difficult to decide among them. Why are there so many theories of matching? Well, perhaps it's because it's very hard, it's proven very hard to test them. Why is it so hard to test competing theories of matching? Because in independent and dependent areas, reinforcement and choice in concurrent schedules are not separate enough. For example, probability of reinforcement that is, the probability that reinforcement would be delivered after a response is one of the independent variables in the momentary maximizing theory of matching. But probability of reinforcement in concurrent schedules depends on the subject's behavior. So there's a contract. And essentially, cause and effect in concurrent schedules are ambiguous in a way. We adopt a momentary maximizing perspective, it becomes very, very difficult to untangle the contingencies. And so we can continue trying to untangle those contingencies, or we can say, well, what if we use a procedure in which the reinforcement outcomes and the choice behavior, the independent and dependent variables, were better separated? Perhaps such a procedure would prove easier to understand. And in fact, such a procedure is available and has been known for a long time. It's called concurrent chains. And this procedure is just a simple extension of concurrent schedules. The initial links or choice phase of this procedure is just a regular concurrent schedule. The pigeon has two keys to pack. In this case, there's a V out of 10 second schedule which is running during the initial links. And uh, at the end of the V out of 10 schedule, the computer decides whether uh, left response or right response is going to be Reinforced. But in this case, instead of reinforcing responses with food, uh, a left key response causes a change in stimulus color on that key. Each key changes from white to red. There now is a fixed interval eight second schedule, which is in effect. So after eight seconds, the first response produces food, and then we go back to the initial links. On the other hand, if the, pigeon, if the computer had armed the right initial link key for a terminal link, then after the VI10 has elapsed, right key response produces change in color on that key. Now there's an FI 16 second schedule. After 16 seconds, response produces food and we go back to the initial links. So in this procedure, the response allocation in the initial links is a measure of the relative strength of the red and green stimuli as conditioned reinforcers. 
that's the traditional interpretation. Or we could say that the response allocation in the initial links is measured the relative value of the terminal link schedules, FI8 and FI16. And the typical result is that pigeons in this case, if you train a pigeon up with this procedure, they would respond relatively more often to the initial link preceding the FI8 schedule. So it's not surprising, given the, given the close relationship between concurrent chains and concurrent schedules, that the matching law was originally investigated as in terms of whether or not it also would apply to concurrent chains. And another classic paper by Bernstein, again, I would strongly advise any student going into this area to examine this paper carefully. Bernstein, 1964, found that the initial link, relative initial link response rate matched the relative rate of reinforcement in the terminal links. And his interpretation was that uh, matching applied not only to primary reinforcement, which he'd shown in the 1961 paper, but also to responding maintained by conditional reinforcement. And, but we have to quantify conditional reinforcement strength, or you could say value, uh, in terms of the reinforcer rate during the terminal links. But this uh, matching is applied to concurrent change random problems, primarily because a uh, classic result reported by Ed Pantino, who showed that preference response allocation in the initial links depended on the initial link duration. And he proposed the direction theory, which probably many of you are familiar with. Uh, I won't talk much about it. Delayed reduction theory, but uh, basically uh, his interpretation was that the value of the terminal link stimuli depended on the overall context of the reinforcement. Now, when I was in graduate school, I started, I, I, I picked up a, on, on a suggestion that Michael Davison made that we should try to extend the generalized matching law to apply to concurrent chains. Because if you could do that, then it would be possible to unify this research on concurrent schedules and concurrent chains. And so I reanalyzed archival data and proposed the, what I call the contextual choice model. Uh, when you propose a model, you have to come up with a name for it. Uh, but this is really just an extension of the generalized matching model. I'm not going to talk about really what makes this special. It has to be, basically the model assumes that the sensitivity to the enforcer variables in the terminal links of the current chain depends on the temporal context. It's similar to Fantino's fluid reduction theory, but incorporating that idea, the ratio of the terminal to initial link durations, incorporating that in the context of generalized matching. And in my original paper, I showed that it provided a description of uh, response allocation in concurrent chains that was roughly comparable to the generalized, to what the generalized matching law could do for concurrent schedules. But the interpretation of this model that I would like to emphasize for today's talk is that it specifies constraints under which generalized matching should occur. In other words, if you control your, if you control for temporal context in the concurrent chain, you keep the average initial and terminal link duration is constant, then we should see generalized matching. And in fact, in pretty much every experiment that I've run, I've been able, that, that is steady state experiments, uh, I've been able to find good evidence for generalized matching. These are data from, uh, from one pigeon from, from the paper that I published back in 1999, in which the Terminal link schedules were VI, and I varied the immediacy ratios across conditions. And uh, we can see that the points are, are all following along. Uh, that is, they're all they're, they're well described by the, the regression lines. Uh, the fill circles refer to the fill data points refer to conditions in which the overall reinforcement magnitude for both alternatives is large, and the unfilled for conditions in which the overall magnitude is small. That manipulation turned out to have no effect on sensitivity to delay. Uh, but you can see that the data look quite similar. Here I plotted the log initial and response ratio against the log immediacy ratio, and it's a linear function. So just as the generalized matching model would predict, we get a linear relationship between 
water dependency ratio and the water response ratio. Now, the key assumption of this generalized matching approach to current chains is that initial wind response allocation matches the relative frequency and value of the terminal and stimulant. And this is just the same assumption that goes back to Down and Rackman's original concatenated batching model. Value is determined by an additive combination of reinforcer dimensions, basically the most commonly studied one in the delay. We can also look at magnitude and also probability of reinforcement. And the effects of frequency and value and effects of different dimensions on value should be independent. That's the cardinal assumption uh, of the theoretical matching model that Kinley noted in his 1972 paper. And if this assumption holds, and if I can convince you that it holds, then I'll ask you to believe me that we've achieved the original goal of the current science uh, paper, because we will have understood how response allocation depends on different dimensions of the reinforcement. And so to test this assumption requires, if we're going to be looking at two different quantitative variables, we need to use factorial design in which the two, each of the two variables uh, is manipulated parametrically. And in many of these studies, the ones that I've conducted, I've generally used multiple component procedures, essentially procedures in which pigeons are exposed to three different concurrent chains within each session. This was because when I was in graduate school, I knew I only had a few years to finish, and I, I worked out how, many, how long it was going to take me to run the experiments. Uh, if I did, if, if I just used one concurrent chain per session, I realized I didn't have a prayer of finishing anything. So I had to use these multiple component procedures. So, uh, in these procedures, the components will differ along one variable, while the other variable is changed across conditions. And this is important. The relative values of the variables are mixed with the overall values of the constant, just as Kernstein did in his original experiment. And what we can do is make scatter plots, generalized matching scatter plots, and examine whether or not the, the regression lines are parallel. They're parallel, that suggests that the variables are having an independent effect on response allocation. We can also do statistical tests for interaction. These are all I've often reported in the journal articles. So a number of studies, I'm just going to show you the results from these studies. We've looked at delay and magnitude, that's Grace et al. 2002. Uh, Carla Madsen, who's just completed her PhD at the University of Canterbury, has looked at delay and probability together, and also magnitude and probability together. And Mark Berg and I just last year published a paper in JF looking at uh, the relative frequency of conditioned reinforcers and the value, and testing whether or not they had uh, independent effects in the choice. So, for reinforcer delay and magnitude, uh, the Grace et al. 2002 paper, we have a three component concurrent change procedure in which the initial wind schedules were always VI40, VI40 schedules. <laughs> The reinforcer magnitudes of uh, different cross components. In the red component, the, 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 the duration of drain access was larger for the left key than it was for the right key. In the green component, the magnitudes were reversed, and in the white component, the magnitudes were the same. And then across conditions, we varied the terminal length of the VI schedules to give immediacy ratios of 4 to 1, 1 to 4, 2 to 1, 1 to 2. But we've kept the overall. Uh, delay and the overall reinforcement magnitude constant in each component. And these are just the group mean data. I could have taken data from any, any of the pigeons, but just to keep things simple, I've just taken the average. Uh, you can see that the lines are basically parallel. The way to understand these plots that I'm going to be showing you, we've got the log immediacy ratio uh, on the x-axis, the log initial and response ratio. So the fact that the lines are increasing is that's the effect of relative delay. But the separation between the lines is one line for each component. And so for the red component, when the magnitude favored the left key, you can see responding is biased toward the left key, compared to the green component, 
in which the magnitude favored the right key. So it was finding their bias toward the right key. And in the light component of the magnitudes were equal, there's basically no bias. So the fact that those regression lines are parallel says there's no interaction, which means that the effects on immediacy, the effects of delay, relative delay and relative magnitude, are additive and independent on response elevation. Reinforcer probability of delay, uh, Max and Grace and McLean, we were, were writing it, but we haven't submitted it yet. We used a similar kind of design, a similar three component design. Uh, we actually had two groups of pigeons. We used both independent and interdependent initial and schedules. Uh, the terminal and schedules were all fixed time, uh, either 10, 20, 20, 10, or 15, 15 across the three components. So we've got relative immediacy varying across components, and across conditions, we vary the reinforcer probabilities for left and right schedules, uh, from 5 to 1 to 1 to 5, 2 to 1, and 1 to 2. And we also study both signaled and unsignaled conditions. That is, in a signaled probability procedure, we basically tell the pitch with a flash and house light if it's, if it's not going to get a reinforcement from that particular terminal light, whereas in an uns whereas in an unsignal procedure, you don't have any house light flashing, and then at the end of the terminal light, they either get a reinforcement or they don't get a reinforcement. <coughs> so these are the results, uh, the group mean results from, from that study. And again, you can see we've got the group average uh, for the unsignaled, uh, the independent and interdependent both looking pretty parallel, and for the Signal conditions, you can see that again the lines are approximately parallel, the slopes and also the separation of the regression lines uh, are smaller than in the unsignal conditions, and that suggests that the signaling of reinforcement outcomes has attenuated control by both probability and immediacy. Um, but basically, the effects still appear additive, regardless of whether the outcomes were signal or not. In a companion study, we looked at reinforcer probability and magnitude, and I'll go over the details of this one quickly because it's quite similar to the other experiment. In this case, the critical difference was the terminal and schedules were always FT15, FT, in other words, after 15 seconds, they would either get a reinforcer or not. But the magnitudes now were four seconds and two seconds, two seconds, four seconds, three seconds, and three seconds. Uh, and so that is we're varying the force of magnitude and probability. And once again, these data perhaps are a little bit messier than the data from delay and probability, but we can detect no evidence for non-parallel, no evidence for anything systematic in terms of an interaction between the two variables. And one final study, uh, Mark Bird and I last year looked at the enforcer frequency, the relative frequency of entries into the terminal lens and the relative value of, of the terminal lens, again using the three component procedure. And once again we found that the regression lines were parallel. So here we've got the log immediacy ratio. So the terminal lens schedules were being varied. That's how we vary the value of the terminal lens. And across components we vary the relative frequency of entry into the and once again, the lines were parallel. The effects of reinforcement frequency and reinforcement value were independent. So, basically, the results of every study in which the relative values of two variables have been manipulated with the overall average kept constant has found independence. And the violations of independence that have been reported are common when the overall levels variables had been changed. And this is a table which was taken from our 2004 paper that basically summarizes all the studies that we could find that have tested the independence assumption. And basically for the panel, for the little 3x3 three three matrix on the left, the answers are all yes, meaning that yes, the variables were independent when the relative values were varied with the absolute level of control, but when the absolute levels are changed, then things become uh, more difficult to start getting violations of the independence assumption. So what I will say, what I will conclude, 
uh, at least this part of the talk. And I'm running a little bit short, so I'm going to have to hurry up with some of the stuff I'd like to talk about in the rest of my talk. But basically, the results confirm the theoretical matching law as outlined by the 1972. Choice matches relatively enforced value. Value is determined by an additive combination of different reinforcing variables. With the caveat that this relationship holds only the overall levels of the variables are controlled. And this essentially is a quantitative law effect because it delineates in a quantitative way the relationship between reinforcer variables, reinforcer parameters, and behavior. Now, this is important because it sets us up with some powerful quantitative models which enable us to understand other phenomena. And again, I'm not going to have time to talk about these. But we now have a much better understanding of the relationship between delay and reinforcement value. So research on temporal discounting is really enabled by the success of the matching law. Uh, we understand a lot more about trade-offs between different dimensions of reinforcement, perhaps most prominently, delay versus amount, the whole uh, class of self-control, the whole class of research on self-control, and also resistance to change. Um, Tony Nevin and I have showed that um, behavioral persistence, um, the resistance of responding to disruption, uh, is correlated with value, the value of the schedule in terms of preference in the current chains. So, how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay. All right, well, I'll try to be very quick. Um, but all of this, perhaps it seems a little bit dry, we're sort of tying up things, we've got the matching law all set. But one thing to remember about all of the studies I've talked about so far, they're based on steady state designs. The subjects get a lot of experience with a particular pair of schedules. You wait till a responding is stable, then you change to the next condition and run another 30 sessions, and, and so forth. So the data are molar, we're, we're collapsing data, we're pulling data across sessions uh, when the data are stable. Questions, for instance, like, can you learn anything from studying choice in transition? What happens when we change the conditions of reinforcement? And hopefully, we will be able to learn through studying choice in transition uh, how an organism learns to value stimuli in the environment. Um, we've got, we understand, we think we understand value now, uh, but by studying choice in transition, we'll understand how they come to learn to value one alternative relatively more than another. And I had three experiments that I wanted to present, and maybe I will walk it through very, very quickly. The first experiment looks at choice and timing. And this uses a concurrent change procedure uh, in which I've added a feature such that the terminal link schedules are the same as trials in a peak procedure. Peak procedures do the research on timing, basically some small percentage, 25% of the terminal links. Uh, no food is delivered, and the terminal link stimulus extends well past the time of reinforcement such that we can measure the temporal control of responding on the new trials. Um, in this experiment, Grayson in 1999, we trained the humans up on FI20, FI40 terminal link concurrent chain, and then we trained we, we put them in just a peak procedure, so it's like they weren't getting the initial anymore. They're only getting the terminal ones, and we changed the FI40 to an FI10, and then we put them back into the concurrent chains with peak procedure to see whether or not their choice of the initial links would reflect the updated value of the terminal length that used to be FI40, but now is FI10, and so the key question was whether the choice of the third condition like the updated values of the stimuli established in the second condition. And this slide just shows uh, that responding on peak trials uh, was approximately sort of, sort of normal uh, type of result that we would expect in this procedure with a, a maximum response rate at about the time of the FI schedule. But the critical, uh, the critical result is the data from the third condition, which if we examine these, the blue circles show the medians from the, from the peak trials for the FI20 and the FI10. And so the first two points are the data from the 
from the condition in which they only experience the peak procedure, so they're put back into concurrent chains. They continue to time the 20 and 10 second delays accurately, but the choice in the initial lengths, these are the, the, uh, the filled circles, required many sessions to reverse preference. So what happened was the pigeons required a lot of sessions to change their choice behavior, even though their ongoing behavior in the terminal lengths said they knew what the delays were. So these pigeons were very confused. Um, there seemed to be separate control, stimulus control on the initial and terminal lengths. And these data are a challenge to value, to the idea that the value of stimulus is control and choice. Now I'm going to skip over a second experiment. I'm sure I'm just about running out of time. I really wish I had time to talk about this one. But unfortunately, I gave a poster on, on this last night. This is one of Liz Kyle and I done an experiment looking at choice and time. And damn, I just have to skip it. But I would like to tell you about one final experiment in which um, Aunt McLean and I have used a rapid acquisition procedure. So instead of steady state, where we give the pigeons the same terminal lengths over many sessions, the pigeons in this experiment got a different pair of terminal lengths every day. Uh, and not only that, but we varied the relative delay, magnitude, and probability of reinforcement in the terminal lengths across sessions according to three independent random series. So for the left and the right terminal lengths, one delay was always eight seconds, the other was 16 seconds. The magnitude, one was four seconds and one was two seconds, and the reinforcement probability was either 100% or 50%. So we're varying delay, magnitude, and probability across sessions, but every day the pigeons were getting a new, basically a new pair of schedules. And you couldn't predict from one day to the next what, whether the delay was going to be shorter on the left today or the magnitude was going to be shorter on the right. And the reason that we did this experiment is because we had originally shown uh, in a paper in 2003 that if you just vary the delay across sessions, that the pigeons were very good at learning to learn, that they would adapt their behavior. They would uh, figure out which delay was shorter very rapidly in the session and then show a strong preference. So we wanted to see what happens if we vary three parameters of reinforcement. We ran it for 175 sessions, and basically we were we were very surprised to find that uh, control, and this basically shows sensitivity to the current session immediacy magnitude probability ratio and the ratio from the prior session. Uh, as a function of basically blocks of trials within the session. And all birds, before the first half of the session, all birds showed strong control by all three reinforcement dimensions. And the acquisition rate was similar for each, each dimension. So delay magnitude and probability, each control response allocation to a similar degree. The acquisition rate is about the same for each dimension and we found no evidence of any interaction at all. It was as if the pigeons were like a regression model. They effortlessly combined the information across the three different reinforcer variables. And I don't know how they do this, but um, I think we have to understand how if we're really going to arrive at a deeper uh, understanding of the choice. So just to leave you with my take home messages, uh, Kernstein's original goal has been reached. We can understand the law of effect as matching to relative value. This is valid so long as the overall reinforcement variables are held constant, and we're talking about relative reinforcement variables. So, um, in that sense, I would say that we've achieved the goal that Kernstein set out. Value as a theoretical construct, it's incredibly useful, it's made possible. Um, a lot of research in applied areas of humans, temporal discounting and self-control. Uh, its status as an explanatory construct perhaps is called into question uh, by some data on acquisition of choice, and there are a lot of questions that we have to uh, really examine. We don't know whether or not value is valid as an efficient cause of behavior. It works very well in descriptive models, 
Uh, but does it, is it really responsible for changes in the organism's behavior from moment to moment? I don't know. Value like beauty may be in the eye of the beholder. And so, just like to close by thanking my collaborators um, and thank you.